Hey everybody, I'm Austin with PDQ.com. Uh, today we're going to be talking about basics of networking and troubleshooting part one. Uh, basically, this is important for you to know as a sysad. Uh, I know it's it's crazy uh, that networking would have anything to do with system administration. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is try to break down the fundamentals and uh, make everything as clear and concise as possible for you guys. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started on that. So what we have here is the overview. So before I get into this, uh, what this is going to cover is basically everything in a net plus certification uh, with a little bit of CCNA and some CCMP uh, as well in later uh, courses. But today is basically net plus. So if you grab your exam uh, review from uh, CompTIA, uh, you can easily follow along here. I've omitted some things like ports and protocol memorization and things like that. But this is going to be stuff that you would want to know uh, either for your own use or for an exam. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start off with some introduct introductions. My name is Austin Malmborg. Uh, I've been doing networking for about six years uh, in the military, in enterprise uh, locations uh, all across the globe. Uh, I have multiple Cisco certifications, CCNA, CCMP. Um, never took the net plus, but uh, hopefully you can uh, beat me on that. Uh, and like I said, my experience in networking goes from SMB all the way to enterprise. Uh, so hopefully I can teach you some knowledge uh, that'll advance your own. Uh, so what we're going to start out with is the OSI model. Now I like to start off with the OSI model for one simple reason. It's, it's an amazing education tool. Uh, it easily describes what needs to or what protocol lies where. And uh, when we're talking about networking, you'll hear people say layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four. I'm sure you've heard this yourself, even used it yourself. Um, OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnection Model. Uh, not super important to know that, but just in case you, uh, you end up getting asked randomly, there you go. Um, I will say that it's not, it's not definitive. I uh, the OSI model is a education tool. Uh, you'll see plenty of other models. I'm pretty sure there's another model called the network model, but it basically breaks down protocols in a different way than the OSI. But for our learning purposes throughout these courses, uh, I would pay attention to this model right here, and uh, you'll kind of get an understanding of what we're talking about. Um, so when you're talking networking, you're usually talking the bottom four layers. And when I say bottom four, I'm talking layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four. So I'm going to simply break those down. You can go ahead and read the model right there on the screen if you want uh, to get a better idea. But layer one, first and foremost, is talking about cabling. Uh, it's basically just that yeah, uh, Cat5 standard uh, that any any fiber standard they fall along or they fall within this uh, this category right here. Um, next is data link. So that when you're talking layer two, most people are talking within a broadcast domain uh, or within a VLAN switches. Uh, these are the types of either protocols or, or technologies that are typically discussed within layer two. Layer three is basically IPv4 and IPv6. There are other uh, layer three protocols, but for this mod or these modules, we'll be talking specifically about IP. And then uh, layer four, uh, TCP and UDP protocols uh, definitely fall within layer four of the OSI model. Uh, it's typically called the transform or excuse me, transport uh, layer, uh, but these protocols would lie within there. So if you were taking an exam, they said, hey, what are, and which of these lay, lie within the layer four of the OSI model? That would be TCP and UDP. Uh, so what happens is uh, all these kind of layer into each other like a, like a cake, right? Uh, you've got physical, and then on top of physical is data link. And then encapsulated, you could say, within data link is IP. And then encapsulated within IP is the transport layer. Uh, and then so on and so forth up until your application. Uh, we'll get into that a little more with Wireshark here soon, but uh, just in case, uh, or I will reference this back to this uh, in a later segment. Um, so we're going to talk about some properties of network traffic. Uh, it's easy, it's easier to describe broadcasts as a one to all. And when I say one to all, it's basically uh, within a broadcast domain. So uh, a broadcast domain is the boundary of a broadcast. If a broadcast was sent on the network, let's say an ARP, uh, where, at what points would that end, uh, or what devices would receive that broadcast, right? So I'll go ahead and draw that here. Uh, so 
We have router one, switch one, and PC one right here. Uh, if you were to define a broadcast domain, I, me, I would say that this right here, excuse my hand drawing, but that right there is what you would call a broadcast domain. So if PC one were to send an ARP uh, on this network, then everything within that red circle would be considered the broadcast domain. Uh, typically, router interfaces define broadcast domains. Switches do not. Uh, we'll touch on how you can uh, separate broadcast domain later, but in this scenario, when we're talking a broadcast uh, or a broadcast domain, this is what we're talking about. Let, and we're assuming this is all one flat network, uh, all on one VLAN, all that good stuff. So multicast. Multicast is usually defined by the uh, broadcast domain as well, unless you do some fancy routing, which we can get into in another, another module. But basically, if you were to imagine that circle one more time, if PC1 were to send a multicast, uh, multicast is defined by specific group types, right? Uh, it's usually within the address of a layer two or layer three header uh, by standard. There are certain IPs and certain MAC addresses that are defined as multicast addresses. So uh, if PC1 were to send a multicast packet, uh, it would be in standard, as you would hope, and then anybody listening on that standard would receive that packet. Uh, anyone not would just drop the packet and call it good. Uh, even some switches will do that for you, where they'll know what switches are listening to what uh, IPs, or it, it's typically multicast IPs that the switches will uh, annotate, and then they will go ahead and drop that for you, but we're, that's a little advanced for this situation, so we're going to assume that the PC drops it here. And then unicast is, the easy, is definitely the easiest one to understand from one device to another. Uh, so if you were going to google.com, that's a unicast uh, property, or, or excuse me, you'd be utilizing the unicast definition to reach google.com. Um, it's one-to-one, it's, -one, it's as simple as it gets, uh, and I hope, I hope you memorize these because these are typically, when we're talking broadcast, multicast, and unicast, you'll hear this all the time if you're within the networking realm, if even outside of that, within system administration or what, whichever uh, domain you happen to fit in. Okay, so this is where we're going to get a little bit deep into uh, into properties of network traffic. So what we're defining here is the maximum transmission unit. Uh, basically, it's the maximum size a PDU, a, a protocol data unit, is allowed to be within a network uh, available to layer three and upwards. When I say upwards, layer four, five, six, seven. Um, it can be adjusted, but uh, typically you're not going to. Uh, and most... The default MTU for most devices is 1500. Uh, and I want to go ahead and display this for you within Wireshark. So what we're going to do is something crazy. And let me go ahead and open a new command here for you, or command prompt. Let's do this. So if I were to ping, let's say, excuse me, 101. So the size of that packet is about 32 bytes, right? Well within that 1500 limit we just set. So with a ping command to set the size is about, let's say 1500. That's the, that's the size we set, right? If you were to go ahead and ping that, it works, right? But as you said, that was available to layer, from layer three up to layer seven. What we're missing there is layer two and even some layer one uh, CRC checks. Uh, basically, the maximum size a packet, a PDU is allowed to be in most scenarios without dot one Q tagging is 15, 18 bytes, right? Uh, so if the MTU is 1500, then why was I able to send a 1500 byte packet to 1.1.1.1? .1 .1 .1 .1? It's uh, fragmentation. Uh, we're not gonna go too deep into fragmentation, but what happens is the router upstream recognizes that that packet does not meet its MTU value and it actually splits the packet based on the MTU you've set. So in this case, uh, our router in this building detected that that MTU was too high. It split the packet just right. So I'm going to guess 14, uh, between 1472 and 1500. And then the rest of the packet was maintained by the router and forwarded for us. And then the packet that came back was re was also uh, fragmented by the far end router at Cloudflare and uh, was given back to us in a fragmented sense. You don't want to do fragmentation. Fragmentation is bad, 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 bad. I won't go, we won't go into too deep why, but if you're curious, go ahead and Google it uh, as to why you wouldn't want to do this. But uh, in our case, if you want to send a ping that can't be fragmented, you'd want to send, I believe it's the F flag, excuse me. 
Oop. And it's going to be in front of our value here. If you can see there, the packet needs to be fragmented, but the DF bit is set. Again, the DF bit sits within, I believe, the IP header. If it's triggered, then the router will not fragment that packet and then give you this error. Uh, so what is the largest ICP packet we can send? I know the secret already. It's 1472. 1472? Why 1472? Well, what I want to do is open Wireshark, pinging 1.1.1, and I'm going to, we're going to kind of break down what's happening, if that's all right. So let me open that up real quick for you. So now that we have ICMP up, or at least we're filtering for ICMP, let's go ahead and send a packet or a few packets. All right, we've grabbed this first one right here. And let me pull this back over. I apologize. So what we've got open here is Wireshark. Uh, we've got three sections. The top is a description of each packet. The middle is the header for each packet, which we'll go into. And the bottom, I usually like to hide, but it uh, is the byte information for the entire packet. Um, so right here, if you want to follow along, is uh, we're seeing 15, 14 bytes on the wire. A little more than a 1500 value we said, but like I said, Ethernet has a 14, I believe a 14 byte uh, addition on top of the MTU value, right? So if we were to break this down per header, and it's kind of hard to see here, but on the bottom, below the hexadecimal values that are displayed, you can actually see the size of each header. So Ethernet, in this case, is 14 bytes. We can see that the size of the IP packet is 20. And we can see that the ICMP message is 1480 bytes. That doesn't make any sense, right? If you're going to, if we look back at our ICMP that we shot out to quad one, we'd see that we sent 1472. Where are we getting these extra eight bytes from? Um, well, let's go ahead and display those real quick. So if we were to break down the ICMP into its further categories, you've got the data. The data here, it should be obvious that we've sent 1472 bytes worth of data. In terms of ICMP, data is just mumbo jumbo garbage uh, just to get the byte size you're looking for. But those extra eight bytes that we got are actually coming from these other uh, flags we've set within the ICMP header. Uh, so like type, code, checksum, identifier, sequence number, all of those add up to eight bytes, thus giving us 1480 for the ICMP header. But like I said, like the cake uh, analogy I brought up before, ICMP fits within IP, fits within Ethernet, and then that is sent over the wire for uh, 14, 15,000, 14 bytes. Uh, but yeah, if you ever want to break this down, ICMP is a great tool to figure out what the MTU value of your router is upstream. Go ahead and play with that. Uh, do not fragment option and then the uh, L option for the size of the packet or the length of the packet. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much MTU. Uh, like I said, it can be adjusted in a high, in most scenarios, I wouldn't even touch it. Be aware that it's there. Some, some instances of data flow require higher MTU values, uh, like data centers. And I believe the max on gigabit ethernet can be about 9,000 bytes, but in most cases you don't want to touch it. Uh, and the reason you don't want to touch it is that that fragmentation issue, right? If one side is set to 1500, let's say Google, their server is set to 1500 MTU and you say yours to 9000, what you're going to end up getting is fragmentation across that router uh, because you're going to be sending 9000 byte packets, whereas uh, Google itself will not. And I, I, this is kind of simplifying it. There are other aspects within TCP that will help uh, mitigate this, but in this example, that's what you'd want to avoid. If you're control of your entire network or in control of your entire network, uh, then you can set the MTU to whatever you want. But what I would do is just keep it at its basic 1500 and you should be good to go. So that's pretty much it for this section. Thanks again for following along with us here. Uh, we talked about the OSI model. We talked about different properties of network traffic, and then we touched up on MTU and dived into a little bit of Wireshark there at the end. Uh, go ahead and follow us uh, along to our part two uh, in the next video, if you are interested in seeing more, I'm Austin with PDQ.com and thank you very much.